Farmers' children are eight times as likely to die due to homicide than any other children across the United States. Today, we're at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health to speak with Dr. Daniel Webster, Deputy Director of Research for the Center for the Prevention of Youth Violence. Dr. Webster, thanks for being with us today. Glad to be here. Dr. Webster, what is the mission of the Center for the Prevention of Youth Violence? Well, as the name implies, our main goal is to try to, try to prevent youth violence. Hmm. The way we go about that is to conduct rigorous research that tells us the best ways to prevent youth violence and to uh, use existing research uh, to inform programs and policies that are being put in place in Baltimore and around the country hmm. to address, as you indicated, one of the most serious uh, health problems facing uh, urban youth. Paint us a picture of the impact of youth violence on the people of Baltimore and what communities are most vulnerable and why? Well, in Baltimore, as in unfortunately many cities, uh, homicide is the leading cause of death mm. for young people um, up to age uh, 25 at least. In right. some places it goes up even to 34. Mm. Um, but as you indicate, certainly some communities are impacted far more than others. Mm -hmm. What we find in Baltimore and many other cities is that uh, homicide is worse generally when disadvantage is most concentrated. These are neighborhoods where there are few individuals with uh, stable jobs, a mm -hmm. uh, lot of unemployment, a uh, lot of families uh, struggling, few uh, two-parent homes. Um, and, and again, it's, it's that everyone is in that boat is mm -hmm. what distinguishes the communities that are most uh, affected by violence. So you know, do you, can you tell us some zip codes? Because I know there are usually some hot spots with regard to that. Well, the areas historically in Baltimore that have had the highest rates of gun violence are actually in the shadows of our East Baltimore sure. campus. Uh -huh. uh, so East Baltimore and West Baltimore have some of the highest rates of gun violence historically, and that, mm -hmm. that remains. Uh, more recently, Northeast has yeah. uh, seen a surge in, in violence as yeah. well. That's, that's a my great home concern. district. That's where I was raised, and I, I know that those statistics are going up. I know you collaborate with many organizations and initiatives across the city. What are some of the more successful strategies that you've been able to employ? The program that I myself have worked most closely with and have been evaluating now for almost five years is a program called Safe Streets. Mm -hmm. It is a uh, sort of born of a public health idea that violence, of course, first is a behavior, and it acts much like a social contagion. The individual who designed the uh, intervention from Chicago, Gary Slutkin, had uh, worked in the prevention of infectious disease for much of his life. What he found to be very successful are, uh, even though we recognize there are these big root causes mm -hmm. of violence, we can talk about unemployment and, and uh, poverty and these kinds of things, but to really turn a health problem around, whether it's infectious disease or violence, you have to go directly to the issue. What is the very direct behavior that's causing the outcome? So he created this intervention basically to try to get people to stop shooting each other. Sure. Now that sounds a little bit simplistic, mm -hmm. and, and frankly, I was very um, dubious uh, about whether this could actually, could actually work. Happen, yeah. But uh, it, the data now suggests that it's actually been quite effective mm -hmm. in uh, most of the areas that it's been employed in Baltimore. One of the things that I think is most incredible about the work that you do is the way that you've been able to kind of codify it um, and to, to, to make a record of it. Um, so tell me how you would impart that information to the people of Baltimore so that they are, one, aware of the impact of uh, youth violence and in violence pre prevention uh, measures and how they can be a part of the solution. The main thing that I try to communicate uh, to the public or policymakers or, or individuals in the community is this is a solvable problem. Um, and that's the biggest hurdle to get over. All right, so I am Joe or Jane Blow on the street. Tell me three things that I can do as an average citizen of the city of Baltimore to help your efforts, the police department, and, and whomever else curb uh, youth violence. As parents, first of all, of course, you look after your own children and, and make sure they have what they need. Are they monitored safely? Are they doing well in school? Uh, who are they hanging out with? Those types mm -hmm. of things are, of course, very, very important. Um, 
then think of yourself as a community member. Can communities work together? So I'm not only worried about my kids, mm -hmm. I'm looking out at the neighbor's kids sure. as well, and I'm working with other parents to make sure, do we have constructive things for our youth to be doing? Right. Um, are there problems that need addressing? Is there a vacant house that drug dealers are, are sort of taking over in the neighborhood? Well, we can't stand for that. We have to coalesce mm -hmm. to come together. How can I make my community safe? Mm -hmm. We're in a time now of, of budget cuts. What's important to us? So um, I think you need to let policymakers know violence prevention is a priority. Safety is, uh, is, is our number one priority, and we need to invest in it. Dr. Webster, what is the most successful strategy that you've employed in Baltimore? Well, the strategy that has been, had very profound impacts uh, is safe streets. Mm -hmm. Now, they've only been in a few neighborhoods, but the neighbor, that's the largest research project that we've been involved in with our center. What we found is that the two neighborhoods currently employing the program, uh, one is in Cherry Hill in South Baltimore, mm -hmm. okay. one is in East Baltimore, McElderry Park. Yes. Both of those communities have reduced homicides by more than half. Really? In implementing their program. In what period of time? Uh, well, McElderry Park has been in play for a longer period. They were the first community to uh, implement Safe Streets. Mm -hmm. uh, that was in uh, July of 2007, okay. and they're still working. Mm -hmm. We found that when they came in and started to get their folks on the street and implementing their program, they went for nearly two years without a single homicide. Wow. You can't find, if you go back in history, any two-year periods where there's no homicides in that community, sad as that is. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they really, right out of the gate, showed that uh, despite what we all think, that uh, you can't do anything about violence in Baltimore, uh, it's ingrained culture and all these other things, they immediately went in started mediating conflicts, changing dynamics between individuals, and, and made a profound impact. Cherry Hill has been in play for over two years, mm -hmm. and in our research, we estimated that they've reduced homicides by 50, 60, 56%. Mm -hmm. um, so they're doing a fantastic job in Cherry Hill as well. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna be talking to the leadership at with State Streets um, during this show. But I, I love how you're seeing a tangible difference in the uh, ethos of, of these programs going into those communities and meeting the needs of the people who are right there. When they do more mediations, fewer people die. Mm -hmm. We're also seeing the change in attitudes. Mm -hmm. So I think this is not just luck. They really did something on the ground to change the conditions in places with very high rates of violence and, and made them very different communities. That's fantastic. Well, I'm grateful that the Johns Hopkins Woodward School of Public Health has made an investment in Baltimore, but also how Baltimore actually codifies many of the things that are happening in urban communities across the country. So thank you so much for your time and giving us your insights on this matter. Okay. We're here today in Bel Air Edison with community advocate Kimberly Armstrong, who lost her son to violence. Kimberly, thanks for joining us today. You're welcome. Tell us about the community that you raised your son in how it, and how it's changed over time. Well, um, when I first moved here about 17 years ago, it was a very um, close-knit mm -hmm. uh, community, a lot of homeowners. And the way that I've seen it change is not just the violence, but also the influx of drugs, mm. um, which I think has fueled a lot of the violence, a lot also with people losing their jobs and unemployment and the increase of also people coming in being renters. Mm -hmm. I think that has had an effect um, in, both in our area as well. Okay. So you've been a resident of this community for 17 years. Yes. And you uh, are the mother of three children. Yes. Your middle child is the one who uh, succumbed to violence on the streets of Baltimore, actually on this very corner, correct? On this very corner, and his name was Eric. Okay, so can you take us back to the day when Eric perished on this corner? Well, um, I can tell you like this, April, is that I don't really know a whole lot about what happened and even who killed my son or why my son was killed. Mm. And it's been seven years. My goodness. Um, and from the information that I have and what I know is that Eric was on this corner, um, somewhere between here and that corner. Okay. Um, him and a group of friends, car pulled up. Um, someone pulled out a gun and just started shooting. 
and Eric ran down the alley, I guess, to go home. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, one of his friends saw him running and called him and didn't know at the time that Eric was shot. My and goodness. so Eric collapsed on his back porch mm -hmm. and they called 911 ambulance, police came. And at the time I was not home. Okay. And I got a phone call while I was gone. It probably, I probably was gone maybe less than an hour. And all I heard was hollering and mm. screaming and all this noise. And then the call had dropped mm -hmm. and the person called back. And all I heard was Miss Kim or got shot. Oh, goodness. And I just jumped in my car mm -hmm. and I was with one of my friends and they drove as fast as they could through all kinds of red lights. And, um, when I got on the street, it was just chaotic. I mean, when I tell you it was chaotic, it was people everywhere, the ambulance. So I fought my way through the crowd and there I saw my son mm. laying on someone's porch. Um, and actually they said that he had passed away maybe twice before I got there <clears throat> and they revived him. And it, the paramedics would let me through at first and then someone said, that's his mother. Sure. And so while he was laid on the porch, you know, I could reach through the um, railings and I grabbed his hands and I said, I guess, mommy, I'm here and I love you. And he slightly turned his head and looked at me and he passed away. When I knew that Eric was not gonna come home, I, um, I just said it. Mm -hmm. And um, Wednesday, put him on the stretcher and he rolled him by me. I knew he wasn't coming home. Right. So it was a kind of sense of, not, I'm not gonna say peace, it's just that I need to start preparing myself for the worst. Mm -hmm. And as we got to John Hopkins, maybe around 2, 2 a.m. in the morning, they came and told me that it was nothing they could do. Mm -hmm. So then I had to deliver the message to my oldest son. Right. And he couldn't understand what had happened. Right. And his only question was, I don't understand because my oldest son, when he was 16, he was also shot in Lake Clifton inside right. of the school. At the school. At the school, inside of the school, in the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. And because he survived his, his gunshots, he just assumed that his brother would survive too, but he didn't. How old was he at the time? At the time, he was 16 as well. Sure, okay. So from that April is why I fight so hard to keep so many children above ground and out of our jails. Mm -hmm. What was the impact, not just on you and your family, but on the community um, in the days and months to come after um, the killing of your son? Um, I think the impact, it was a lot of rage and anger. Mm -hmm. You know, all the young guys, because Eric was very, he was popular, a lot of people knew him, a lot of people knew me, knew our family. And um, it was a lot of anger. All the kids were walking around with guns. Um, and by my house being the community house, I guess you could say, um, all the kids would come over, but I would have to check them, pat them, down. Pat them down and make sure they were not carrying guns. All right, so these were underage kids yes. who were traumatized by the violence that said, we need to arm ourselves. Yes. And so they basically started to do their own patrolling. Exactly. And not just patrolling in, in their own safety, but protecting me. Mm -hmm. They wanted to protect me as well. Right. Because at the time, nobody knew why my son was killed. And you still know, don't. And still don't. And so they were like, well, you know, we don't know what's going on. Well, we also want to make sure that Miss Kim is safe, too. Absolutely. So even they would patrol my house, uh -huh. like stand outside on somebody else's yard or front or out back or something and make sure they would come by my house and ask me, are you okay? But it was a lot of anger and rage and it's still, and it, it's been that way for, for a very long time. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And um, some of the kids had even, um, some of them stopped coming around because they could see the pain in on you. me, uh -huh. in me, uh -huh. and, and, and the anger in myself, uh -huh. you uh -huh. know? So as a community, as a whole, I think the effect is, is that it's, it's a lot of trauma that has not been addressed. Uh -huh. um, and people don't know how to deal with it. My son now, and he's 27, and he has, he still is not doing well because he still is suffering from the trauma losing his brother. How was your interaction and what is the community's perception of the Baltimore Police Department in lieu of this? People don't trust the police. Mm -hmm. um, they talk about um, how the police has some type of vengeance against people that live in the community. Mm -hmm. People think that it's very racist 
Mm -hmm. um, why is it that the police only come around when there's an incident that occurs, and why does it have to be when somebody, someone is murdered that then you see the police patrol in our area a little bit more frequently, but that, don't, that only lasts maybe two weeks at the max. Have you guys in this community, in you as a community advocate, have you sat down and talked with the police department and talked about some of your concerns? Yes, we have. Uh -huh. um, and it, and, it, and it, they, they do, the, I, I think they try to do their best, uh -huh. you know, and I think that with under the leadership of, of um, Mr. Bill Feld, that there has been a lot of different changes. Uh -huh. And from what I've seen lately, April, to be honest with you, is the community is really coming back. Okay. The community is coming back with a force because we have some really, really good community members and community in our community association. Community association is strong. And what are the other relationships that you think are making this community stronger and safer? Developing good relationships with the schools. Okay, so the schools, community association, clearly a better communication with mm -hmm. the police department. Right. Okay. When you think of the work that you do as an advocate, but also as somebody who is directly affected by losing your child to violence, what would you share with the people of Baltimore as a strategy um, for engaging people in their own communities, but also extending themselves out of communities? Some people live in communities where they never really think about the threat of violence every day. What would you ask them to do and consider, and what kind of resources would you ask them to bring to bear to help us curb violence in, in the city and in neighborhoods like yours? I think that we really, really need to start coming outside of our homes. Right. I think that we really need to stake ground, and like we're posted here um, during this show, is that sometimes we need to post ourselves on some of these corners mm -hmm. and have some type of literature, whether it's just a flyer and say hello. I think that we need to be go back to some of the basics of just being uh, friendly and being, you know, just having genuine caring about one another. You have been experiencing the same house, the same neighborhood, living in the shadow of this for seven years. And you continue to fight. Mm -hmm. You continue to be a stand in the community. We were here on the corner waiting for this segment to begin, and folks know you as kind of like the right. neighborhood mom, and, and right. there's a lot of love there. What do you want folks, again, in other neighborhoods across the city to understand about how to reclaim the space? Because you've clearly reclaimed it. I mean, you could have moved, probably. Yeah. You could have left, but you said, I'm going to stay here. Why did you do that, and how did you reclaim the space? Well, I stayed because I love my community. I love being here, mm -hmm. you know, and I love what I do. You mm -hmm. know, I really believe there's a purpose out of all of this. Mm -hmm. You know, I look at Eric's life as being... His, his purpose was to bring me into my purpose. Mm. Well, we are so grateful that you stayed. Thank and you I'm sure stay. that Eric is looking down on you very proud and the people of Baltimore are embracing you right now and loving you for sharing your witness about your son thank and you. encouraging all of us to do better with regard to safety in our community. So thank you so much for being here and thank you for amplifying thank Baltimore. Thank you as well, April. And McKeldery Park in Southeast Baltimore is the home of Safe Streets East, and we're here today with the coordinator of this program, Gardell Carter. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. You know, I came up in here, and I didn't know what to expect when I came to the office of Safe Streets. I thought it was going to be maybe a little cold, not so cozy. This is a fun little place. It smells good. You guys handed me some cornbread. <laughs> it's really homey. So I'm really excited to be here, and I'm excited to talk to you about this great work. First of all, tell us how you came to do work in violence prevention here in Baltimore City? Uh, well, it had to be because of when I was incarcerated, huh. I met a man named Leon Farouk. Uh -huh. And um, he was doing re-entry at the time when I was on the downswing of my incarceration. And um, we talked for a minute. So upon my release, I came out, I was doing home improvement. And so he called me one day to come over, actually you know, to do some work on his house. Huh. And so he was telling, this was the early part of uh, 2007, and he was telling me, look man, there's an initiative that's gonna be coming and it's dealing with um, violence prevention. And I know you used to work with this program that was down with Tuxin called Reason Street. I huh. uh, became a, a guiding counselor down there with the youth that used to come in through different programs, uh, uh, DJS and everything. So I said, oh, uh, yeah, I'd be interested in that. So around March, he called me again and told me to get my resume together. All right. And so I submitted my resume and went to the interview in the end of March. And then June, no, May, we was called in 2007. 
and the ceasefire, because this program is modeled at the ceasefire. So ceasefire came down and they trained us. So ceasefire uh, is in Chicago, correct? Yes. Yeah, cease, so ceasefire has been doing this work since 2000, I believe. And ceasefire is actually going to be featured in the film that we're going to be highlighting yes, at great. the Pratt Library on Jan January yes. 28th, and you're going to be one of the panelists, so that's great. Yes. Uh, so tell us about how ceasefire in that model became Safe Streets in Baltimore. Uh, I believe Dr. Webster, the health department, and the city was looking for a way to combat violence. Uh -huh. So they went out and started studying a lot of different violence prevention programs. And ceasefire, I think, was one that was on their radar. Uh -huh. So they um, sent a panel of people up, and um, they did all the research, everything that was necessary. And I think um, during a, a lot of round table discussions, they thought about bringing Safe Streets here. So when they got the funding to do that, Safe Streets was brought here in um, 2007. So tell me what specifically Safe Streets does. Okay, the model or the initiative is a public health approach to shootings and homicides. Uh -huh. The main objective of Safe Streets is to reduce homicides and shootings in the McAldery Park area. Okay. Right. To go about there's five core components of the program. You have outreach, well, the first thing you have is community mobilization. Right, so what we have is a violence prevention coordinator, and her job is to mobilize the community, business partners, residents, and everything, and get them on board with a non-violent non approach to things. Uh. Um, to let people know that the homicides and shootings that are taking place in Baltimore City is not a normal thing, and we want to change this, uh. Uh, this behavior and this attitude and this thinking. So that's the community mobilization piece. Then you have what is called the outreach. We have outreach workers. We hire outreach workers that once used to be a part of the problem. Interesting. So um, the outreach workers are people who were formerly people who are exacting violence yes. on others. Okay. Yes. Uh, the outreach workers' jobs are to go out and they build relationships with the highest risk individuals. And when we talk about high risk, we talk about the person that's going to do the shooting or the person that's subject to get shot. Uh. Now, that list of people that get shot ranges. Right. from the highs of drug dealers, robbers, uh, burglars, or whatever, to the person that might just be the thief stealing the man's stash. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or the individual that's running around here carrying guns. Right. Uh, so the outreach workers, they build these relationships with them with the hopes of bringing them on um, into the program and do case management with them, become mentors, big brothers, uh -huh. whatever the need may be, and help them help themselves. So what we do when we bring them on board, we do assessment. Okay. But we allow them to do assessment on themselves. Yes. What are your needs? And then what we do is 100% work with you, 100% to help you help yourself. Got it. So we get them linked up to GED programs, uh -huh. training programs, uh -huh. uh, hospitals, right. drug treatment, whatever the need may be, okay. we try to link them up to services and then we continue to be a mentor to them until we can bring them down from the highest risk down to the lowest risk. And because of the associations and collaborations you have with other entities including the police department and like you are aware of who these folks are? Well, we go out and find them. Ah. Nobody gives us a list. Walk me through what happens when there is a shooting. When there is a shooting in this area, most of the time we are even notified by the health department, the community, or by the outreach workers that go out, they canvass. Uh, once we find out about a shooting, then it's the outreach workers' jobs, the team job, to go out here. And what we're looking for is to find the individual, sit down and talk to them, because we don't want to be bringing this nonsense back in here. We try, we do a rally to let people know this is not something that's going to be acceptable and make Ellery Park no more. Uh -huh. So we respond and we get the residents involved in it because for far too long in Baltimore City, people are numb to a human being being killed or shot right. until it becomes one of their family members. Sure. You know what I mean? So sometimes the responses are large, sometimes they are small. But one thing that is assured, they know that with any shooting or homicide that takes place in this area, Safe Streets is out there and they're going to respond. I mean, they're going to let people know, the residents and the people that we are targeting, that we're not going for this no more, man. Mm -hmm. We want our neighborhoods to be safe. We want our children to grow up. So this is the nonviolent approach. There's a, a, a song that we sing when we're going out. What do we want? Safe Streets. When do we want it now? Mm -hmm. And usually if we have a big crowd, you'll hear this echoed mm -hmm. throughout the whole community. That's very powerful. And we'll walk around five or six blocks 
then we'll go back to the location where it happened at, and we may be there for 10 or 20 minutes mm -hmm. and just, you know, voicing our opinions and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, the outreach worker still goes out and try to, you know, make sure there's no retaliation, you know, to talk to family members, friends, or whatever. Look, man, you know, family member that lost somebody. That's really We heavy. don't need no more losses. Sure. In the you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you appeal to their sensitivities, whatever is there, mm -hmm. or to try to bring them sensitivities back. Mm -hmm. yeah. Since you came into the community, what have you seen as the difference? Uh, clearly there's been a reduction in violence, but how has the community received you all as well? Well, you know, in the beginning, it was a lot of skepticism, mm. even within ourselves, because, you know, it was something new that was yeah. being brought here. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, one of the things they told us how to start meeting people would just walk around and smile and say hello. Well, you know, for us coming from that background, like, oh man, you just don't walk around smiling, telling right. people hello in Baltimore City. But it was a catch, it was a hit, because who was it coming from? It coming the from people guys. that used to be sure. these tough individuals in the street. Mm -hmm. And McElderby Park was the most deadliest area in Baltimore City for 15 to 20 years. Is that right? The highest murder rate and everything. Uh. So after we got started up, you say, what is the difference? We went 22 months without one single homicide. Is that right? Yes. And then this past <laughs> year, from June 19, 2010, all the way to August 10, 2011, we went that long without having a non-fatal shooting. But we got to love these people and, and, and step out, out here and teach them a different way, show them a different way. We are examples for them. Mm -hmm. you know, we are definitely examples because just like we do 411s on them, they do the 411 on us. And once they found out the legitimacy of us and then they see what we're doing every day. And it's consistent. It's right? consistent. Then they respect us more than anybody out here in the world. Right. Right. You know what I mean? And then we show them love. Mm -hmm. You know, at their worstest times and at their best times, mm -hmm. you know, we show them love. Mm -hmm. You know, so this is how Sage Trees has been able to infiltrate this community and make an impact and a difference in this community. The most critical part of the success of the Safe Streets program is the work of its outreach workers. And here tonight, we are with a gang of them, as you can see and they're gonna tell us about the great work that they do in Southeast Baltimore. So I'm just gonna go around and get your names. Uh, my name is Dante Boxdale and I'm an outreach worker for Safe Streets. Wonderful. Corey Peterkin, and I'm an outreach worker from Safe Streets. Todd Carter, outreach worker. All right. David Baker, outreach worker, David Safe Baker. Streets. Okay. Corey Winfield, supervisor. Cornbread maker man, come up in here. Cause you know, I already love, I love a man that can cook. I love a man that can cook. In your role as the coordinator of outreach, that's an awesome responsibility because you know, you are getting the first line of everything, everything. So tell me what it's like to be on the front line, getting the information, but also being able to dispatch these folks out into the streets when you know they're going into challenging situations. At times, uh, it can be difficult because at one time I used to be out here and you know when you see things firsthand you know how to deal with it but when i became a supervisor i had to sit in the office so when they on they got to respond to things are you ready to get in it yeah and, and, and i don't know what's going right. on at the same time I, I feel good because it's coming to us you know the community is looking at us to make a difference mm -hmm. to help out mm -hmm. you know um they call us somebody house get broken in they call us these guys go out and find who did it and return the stuff. You know, those are the things that's never heard or never talked about that we, we actually do beyond just telling the young guys, put the guns down, stop killing each other, you know? I can help, if I can help a young brother take the shortcut and not go through the prison, the, 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 having your mother stressed out, yeah. that, that makes me feel good. Yeah. I want to remind the audience that there is a free screening of the documentary, The Interrupters, that highlights the work of the ceasefire program in Chicago, and that's the program that Safe Streets was actually based upon. A lot of these folks will be in the room sharing their wonderful information along with other advocates that are violence prevention advocates in Baltimore City. Again, January 28th at the Enoch Pratt Free Library, 1 p.m., free and open to the public. We hope you'll join us. What do we want? Say streets. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Say streets. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Say streets. When do we want it? Now.
What do we want? Say streets. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Say streets. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Say